Hi, welcome to the Sabbath School lesson for June 8, 2013. Our title is The Fruitful Vine. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture and we want to look at it, the vine and the branch and our relationship with God as the introduction brings out quite powerfully. The purpose of this illustration was that we can understand God's relationship to us and our relationship to Him. That's what it says in, in, in this introduction. And so as we seek to understand this relationship, in question four, there's a bit of a negative tone which we're familiar with, and that is, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And just, just with those words, you think, wow, that's pretty hard. Am I bearing fruit? If not, I'm going to be cut off. Well, Praise the Lord that he doesn't just slice everyone off in a split second for not bearing fruit. He actually works with the plant, uh, with the branch, and prunes it and does everything he can for it to bring forth fruit. And that's actually brought out in question seven. And as you just flick to question seven, um, there's some really interesting things that I, I got a great blessing out of here. And this was sort of... Uh, errors, if you like, not that errors are good, but errors in people who are connected to Christ. Often when we see someone have an error, we think, well, they're not connected to Christ and we can cut them off in our mind. But here in question seven, every, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And then Ellen White says, Jesus with solemn tenderness explained the purpose of the husbandman. The pruning will cause pain. But it is the Father who applies the knife. He works with no wanton hand or indifferent heart. There are branches trailing upon the ground. These must be cut loose from earthly supports to which their tendrils are fastened. First problem, that a believer who is connected to Christ can be trailing on the ground. And even have their tendrils wrapped around earthly supports. What does that mean? Well, if you look in the personal study quotations, the last one of the whole lesson in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, it says, There are conditions to meet if we would be blessed and honoured by God. We are to separate from the world and refuse to touch those things which will separate our affections from God. God has the first and highest claims upon his people. Set your affections upon him and upon heavenly things. Your tendrils must be severed from everything earthly. So the, 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 tra the tendrils translate to, to mean affections. So here is a true believer in Christ. He is connected to the vine, yet his branches are hanging to the ground or his tendrils are wrapping around earthly supports, what is God going to do to such a person? Well, he is going to remove those tendrils from those earthly supports. Is it nice, is it a nice thing for God to take away the things we are affectionately attached to? And if God takes them away, does it hurt us? When our affections are, you know, like sometimes the tendrils of some vine are, are wrapped around for a long time and they're actually hard and the only thing you can do is actually just break it off. Some tendrils that are quite young, you can untwirl them and then twirl them around something higher off the ground. So here, this explanation of our relationship with God and God's relationship to us is that if our affections as Christian believers, are attached to other things, they will not remain there. God will see to our earthly affections will be put upon Him. And then it says, there's another one. They are to reach heavenward and find their support in God. The excess foliage that draws away the life current from the fruit must be pruned off. So here's another problem. First problem, the tendrils are around earthly supports which was affections upon earth. The second problem is excess foliage. And the foliage is pretentious, a, a, a pretense or a, a, a profession that we become very proud of, like the, um, the parable where the tree had leaves but no fruit. It was boasting to be God's people. It looked so good. 
but there was no actual fruit born on the tree. And so Jesus cursed that. So excess foliage has to be pruned back. God needs to humble us. Take away our affections from earthly things that are a diversion from him. And then it says, the overgrowth must be cut out. So as I, as I read this, and I think, wow, a truly connected believer can have their tendrils around earthly things. Not that it will stay there, but this is, this is what we're reading. Can also have excess foliage and can have overgrowth. It's sort of like the overzealous um, person who comes to follow the Lord and they just go too far, go beyond what God is actually requiring of them and God has to bring them back. But yet these people can still be God's people, can still be someone who is genuinely connected to Christ and yet goes fanatical or goes too far and then the Lord brings them back slowly. Praise the Lord for his, for his, um, his watch care and husbandry work upon us. So even with our faults, we're connected to Christ. We're not faultless at that point. There's the justification process of being engrafted into him and then he comes to sanctify us, to prune us up, so that we would bear the most fruit possible. And then in the last part of question 7, it says the husbandman prunes away the harmful growth. So here you see the tendrils is one problem that a believer can have. Excess foliage is another problem a believer can have. Overgrowth or being overzealous is another problem that a believer can have. And even harmful growth a believer can have. And so the Lord will deal with these. But if you think about this, do you like it? If you're connected to the Lord, would you like that sort of work to be done upon you? Notice this statement in question 7. We already read it. I'm going to read it again. The pruning will cause pain. Just in case you missed it, I'll read it again. The pruning will cause pain. So if I am serious about my relationship with Christ, I must be very conscious to, of the fact that my relationship with the Lord is not all smooth sailing in relation to earthly comfort. It, there's pain to be had. And that pain is really, I believe, the, the crossroad of whether we're really going to follow the Lord all the way or not. Because it's humiliating to be pruned back, have excess foliage and the Lord cuts you back a bit. Be overzealous and the Lord has to cut off your extra zeal that's only according to self. Um, to take away your tendrils, it's humiliating for this to take place. And so when we come back to question four, if you look at question four here, every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. But if you read the verse under that in John 15 and verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather him and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So here this word abide appears. We come to Christ, we get connected, life, we receive his life. Yet in the process, there are things to uh, correct us on. We need pruning. That is a humble a humbling work, a humiliating work to be done upon us, are we going to abide in that case of being pruned? The word abide means to stay. If you went into a room and you were humiliated, what would you feel like doing? You'd feel like leaving. That's natural. But here Christ is saying, abide, stay. Think about that. If, you, if, you, if we pick up the context of, of John 15, John 15 in, in, its, in its setting is where Jesus is speaking to the disciples. They have just had the foot washing service. And that service is known as the service of humility because it was actually humiliating. Christ, their leader, their master, came and washed their feet. In their cultural context, that was offensive actually to the disciples peter was even said no i i, I don't want uh, you to wash my feet 
Judas, in the Desire of Ages, Judas actually made his final decision actually not to follow the Lord after he saw his master washing their feet. It was humiliating. And so in the context, they've just had the foot washing, humiliating experience. They come out from the, the, the Lord's Supper and they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the cross is looming before them, only hours away, really. And Jesus comes up with these words, Abide, stay with me. Did Judas stay? No, he didn't. He didn't abide. So what happened to Judas? He was cast forth. He was cast off. This is the question. We come to the Lord. We, ju- we, we make a profession of Christianity. We say, I'm going to follow the Lord. And then when it comes to the cutting work, that painful work that the Lord wants to do upon us, we say, I don't want that. And we get offended, actually, at it. So we don't abide. We, we back off from that scenario. We may still have our profession. We still may put our leaves out. But are we actually really connected? Abide in me. Question four says, abide in me and I in you. Abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his spirit a life of unreserved surrender to his service. So when we look at the disciples, they've been through this humiliating foot washing. They're about to receive the humiliating cross where their Savior is na- the, the Savior is nailed to the cross, who they thought would redeem Israel. And they are scattered abroad. Peter, who is boastfully very sure about himself, saying, I will not deny you. All the other disciples would deny you, but I won't. So he's, he's thinking he's the best out of all the disciples. And he's about to enter in the most humiliating experience of his life when he denies the Lord with cursing and swearing, even worse than the other disciples. So he comes to terms with, I'm actually not the best. I'm the worst of the twelve. And, and he really we- weeps bitterly. This statement is between the two humiliating things, the foot washing and this Calvary experience. And Christ is saying, abide. Notice how many times it says it in question five. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing and then verse 6 says if a man abide not in me so so many times just in this in this passage passage of scripture abide 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 stay 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 there actually when I think of that I think of my when I was training my boxer dog which they're really funny dogs and I was teaching it to sit and stay. Say, stay, and I'd start walking back. Stay, and you have to say stay all the time so they understand what, what you mean with your hand up. Stay there, stay, stay, stay. And the dog's there, oh, it just doesn't really want to stay and is really itching to go. And stay there. And it's, when I read of this, abide, abide, abide. Stay under the pruning knife. Stay so your tendrils will be taken away from the earthly supports, that your excess foliage will be cut off, that all this negative work of the Christian experience can be done because naturally we do not like this work. Abide, abide, abide is the message of this lesson. And if we abide in Him, then we will... We will experience the fruit. We will bear fruit, much fruit, love, joy, peace. And when you look at the, the sort of the picture of what Jesus is saying, there's the humiliation of the foot washing, his message of stay in it, the humiliation of the cross. And then after that, what was an, a major event after that? It was Pentecost. For the disciples who stayed, Judas didn't. He wasn't there at Pentecost. He didn't receive the joy of the Holy Ghost. He didn't receive the fruit. He didn't receive the unity at Pentecost. Why? Because he did not abide in the humiliating experience of Jesus Christ. Oh, it's easy to abide in the nice times. It's easy to abide when the, the loaves and the fishes have been handed out and all the wonderful miracles have been done. But it's a hard thing to abide when 
the pruning knife comes out. The pruning will cause pain. So for those who do not abide, they can still remain in the church. They can still have a profession of Christianity. Notice in question one. Question one. The note under question one, it says, This lesson will be repeated to the ends of the earth. All who receive Christ by faith become one with him. The branches are not tied to the vine by any mechanical process or artificial fastening. So there's, there's no, other than this abiding under the pruning knife of the Lord and under his, his husbandry work directly, there's, n there's no actual way of joining that vine. There's no mechanical process. You can't tape yourself to it. You can't glue yourself to the seat. As, as someone once said, glue yourself to the seat of the church. Artificial fasteners. Can't do it. They are united to the vine and have become part of it. They are nourished by the roots of the vine. So those who receive Christ by faith become one with Him in principle and action. They are united to Him and the life they live is the life of the Son of God. They derive their life from Him who is life. And then the second note. Second note, the upward look, page 182 in question 1. It says, The heart must be united with Christ's heart. The will must be submerged with His will. The mind must become with His mind, become one with His mind. The thoughts must be brought into captivity to Him. A man may be baptized... And his name placed on the church rolls, yet the heart may be unchanged. Hereditary and cultivated tendencies may still work evil in the character. Challenging. Challenging message. And to know that I must abide under, the, under God's humbling experience that he will give me. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. It's not voluntary humility. It's God-directed humility. As he says, of yourself you, cannot, you, you can do nothing. We can't make ourselves humble. God has to providentially bring us face to face with our own sins, with our own deplorable condition, like Peter had. And we must stay in there until the Lord will give us the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. And so this is really the secret of church unity. Church unity actually comes by abiding under that humiliating experience. Because Peter and all the disciples had unity problems. They all did. And Christ, the messages of Christ for all the time of their ministry just didn't sink into their practical experience in relating to one another. They, they were squabbling and fighting of who was the greatest among them. What was the solution to their unity problem? The, the, the solution to it was the humbling experience of Calvary. And... Peter, who was the most outspoken, um, was really, really cut back a lot. And so, and so this lesson shows us that tr there is a certain way of, uh, of unity. Notice in question three, harmony and union, un union exist among men of varied dispositions. It's the strongest witness that can be born that God sent his son into the world to save sinners. It is our privilege to bear this witness. But in order to do this, we must place ourselves under Christ's command. Our characters must be molded in harmony with his character. Did Christ go through humiliation? Yes, he did. He says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Learn of me. Our, our unity can only come when we're in harmony with that humble character of Jesus Christ. That humble character of Jesus Christ can only come under the providential working of God, not by my own decision to become humble. Otherwise, I could be proud about it. It says, Then we shall work together without a thought of collision. Without a thought of collision. Because the Lord has so brought us to the cross of Calvary, to the foot of the cross, that, that we are going to abide and 
our opinions of ourselves are actually very small and our opinion of the Lord is so high and of our brethren is higher and we esteem others better than ourselves. And so just to conclude with, I like the, um, it says here in, in question two, right in the middle of the notation, uh, quotation of, of, actually at the beginning of, of the note under question two, Christian unity consists in the branches being in the same parent stock. So Christian unity requires abiding under the hand of the Lord. The vitalizing pair of the, of the center supporting the grafts that have united the vine. In thought and desire, in words and actions, there must be an identity with Christ. A constant partaking of His spiritual life. Faith must increase by exercise. All who live near to God will have a realization of what Jesus is to them and they to Jesus. May the Lord help us to abide in Him, even when we get humiliated, challenged, cut back, humbled, our overzeal gets blocked. and The way the Lord deals with us, if we can abide in that, the Lord will bring us into a fruitful conclusion. So I pray you've received a blessing and may the Lord bless you as you study further into your lesson and gain many rich blessings. Amen.